I remember when I was a student and some of the classrooms that I actually were just terrible in. And if you ask me about my school experience, I'd often say I was a pretty bad kid. It's not really true. I was a very bad kid in some classes and usually those were subject specific. And the reason that I was bad in those classes was not because I didn't like the teacher. It was because I struggled with the content. And for me, it was more important that I didn't look dumb. So I decided to be the class clown. I started to goof around and I terrorized, you know, some teachers when I was a kid because I just felt really inadequate. And I think that really helped me understand when kids struggle in classrooms. And it wasn't that I would always be bad in those classrooms because it took a really great teacher to understand that, to connect. And I, I feel I wanted to be that person. And when I was talking to Mike Mohammed today, I asked him about some strategies. How would you deal? Because he's a science teacher. That was a class I struggled in, not only academically, but with my behavior, uh, what he would do and how he would actually connect but talking to Mike, and he's an amazing educator, great leader, does really awesome stuff, uh, not only in his classroom, with, with other educators as well. He reminded me of the importance of having conversations to push and to grow and to challenge. And we talked about how these podcasts, for me personally, are a way for me to learn from so many great educators, to learn from so many great teachers, because I actually don't see myself as an expert of anything. What I see is that I'm, I want to be a, an expert learner, that I want to get better at learning. And that means we have to question things. We have to challenge our own ideas and see where we can grow. And Mike reminded me of the importance of that. It is a great podcast. Mike is a great person. You're going to learn a lot from him. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Thanks for listening to The Innovator's Mindset. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And today I actually have my friend Mike Mohammed, and Mike and I have connected uh, for years. It's actually weird to talk to him because I can't remember if we met in person first or we met online first and then, you know, th those roles changed or, you know, I, I don't know because we've connected so many times in so many different spaces and um, I really appreciate his approach to teaching I also have seen him connect with so many educators on uh, social media. They learn from him. He learns from them and an amazing science teacher. And we were just recorded a different podcast. And it's interesting kind of seeing his path to teaching science because like science was not my thing in school. It's probably not my thing as an adult either. Uh, but I, I see obviously see the value in it. And, you know, thinking about like, great teachers that teach that subject and how they get kids that maybe struggle with it, you know, really passionate about it. And some of my best teachers were actually science teachers as well. So Mike, I am like pumped to just sit down and chat with you. I, I love this podcast. And I think I'm kind of selfish uh, in the sense of it's kind of like just me hanging out with people that, you know, I, I really appreciate some people I don't know at all and get to know them. And, you know, you, someone I consider a friend that I've known for, a, I don't even know how long we've known each other now, probably like five or six years. Yeah, yeah. It, whenever the first iMOOC was, that was when the streams first crossed. iMOOC, iMOOC, yeah. right? Yeah. That's uh, yes. yeah. Yes. It's actually funny. Like a lot of people actually, um, I, I like it's a, it's a blur to me, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people kind of not only I think connected to the innovators mi mindset, like that course that we did, like the book study and all that. But it's kind of neat because I've seen them all connect with each other. Because I think you are pretty close with um, a Nick uh, Rock, yep. and mm -hmm. and she's. She's that's where, you know, her and I first connected too. So I don't yep. know if you knew each other before then. So Oh no, that's when we actually connected. We did the last really? po podcast of that first season, uh first thing. Um you put out a call to um, oh, right. participants yeah, yeah. and um Tara Martin was in it and Anik yep. was in it too. So that's when the uh, congealing happens i'm actually it's actually interesting because like i like this this podcast like the podcast what people see right now started for me in 2020 but i actually like set up the podcast with iMOOC so we probably have it recorded yes it is on itunes if people want to hear no it. really yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay so so welcome back <laughs> So Mike, oh. tell, tell everyone, tell everyone a little bit about who you are, like your, and your journey in education and you know, how you got to where you're at today. Yeah. Yeah. I am Mike Mohammed. I have been in 
I, I'm actually going to say I've been teaching for 21 years uh, because I do did really love my student teaching so much. The two mm -hmm. years of my education program, it taught me so much that I really did feel like I've been in the classroom for those two years included. But I've taught in um, two different districts in Wisconsin. The current one I'm in, in Elmbrook Schools in Brookfield, mm -hmm. Wisconsin. I've been there for it's my 16th year here and um, have been continuing to grow now in terms of my path towards science education. Um, I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, my parents are from Pakistan and my, uh, like many immigrant children, get pushed to, actually I'd say a lot of Asian children get pushed to a certain career, whether it be uh, medicine or um, the law or engineering. And I was originally on the path to pre-med when I realized that um, I, I just love school so much and eventually came across I was gonna you know one of the things that someone told me was as a pre-med it's a good idea to not have a major in science so I said oh mm -hmm. I love teaching I'm gonna be secondary education and I loved English it was my favorite subject growing mm -hmm. up and I was going to be secondary education English. And it turns out the more science I took at the college level, the more I loved it. It was, hmm. I wasn't getting the science in the classroom that I was getting at the university level where we would actually do a lot of hand stu hands-on stuff. I would see the applicability of science. And that's when I really truly got my love of science on my own, hmm. as opposed to someone telling me I need to follow this scientific path. And that's and that and so like you were 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 you were planning to go to be a doctor you said is that yep, what, yes the that was on? the original plan and was it um, your plan or your parents plan it was not my it was their plan you know <laughs> um it, it was their plan um and i was going to be a dermatologist because yeah. my parents said that they have the best hours so uh, yeah. i did my ninth grade uh, career paper on dermatology and i i did very well on it but you know the passion wasn't there, you know, when right. uh, I started doing some volunteering in the ER, kind of, it, you know, quickly realized that, man, um, this is not the life that I want. And the ability to push back a little bit on my parents and, um, you know, of course, they were disappointed, but, you know, ultimately, I think they wanted to see success. And being immigrants to this country, sometimes learning what success was and mm -hmm. how what different paths to success could be. Um, they were able to come to terms with it and really do a good job of celebrating. Yeah. And it's probably like one of the reasons you and I have connected because, you know, like I have a similar story. My parents are both immigrants and it's actually funny because like listening the kind of the similarities and stories, uh, like my parents didn't say like, we want you to, the only thing my dad ever said, which was weird. He, I came home at like two in the morning one night and <laughs> it was, I was seriously the weirdest thing. So my parents like said like we want you to get further education, but they never they never really care. They just said like education is a pathway to something that we didn't have access to. Mm -hmm. And I went into my dad's room last night. He's like, "Hey, I want to talk to you." I'm like, and I'm like 21, 22, and he's like, "Have you ever thought about being an air traffic controller?" And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he had like this thing cut out of the paper, and like you know, air traffic controllers make this much money, and blah blah blah. I'm like, uh, "Nah, I never really thought about it." And I'm not even kidding. That's the only time you ever brought it up. And we never talked about <laughs> it ever again. It was just the weirdest thing ever that my dad wanted me to be an air traffic controller for about 30 minutes, but never actually encouraged me to do anything else. But I got to share this with you because I, I know you'll appreciate this. So parents are very proud of went to education. They, uh, they were, you know, they, they saw it like they worked and I, I share this. They didn't work five days a week. Right. They work seven days a week from like 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. Right. They would, my dad would take basically, you know, my mom and dad would take like these afternoon breaks basically because the restaurant's not busy at that time. And uh, they did not want that life for their kids. Like they did not want us working there. And so I like, you know, I went into education. They're very proud. I remember I like my, you know, graduation. And uh, I, I, you know, became a teacher, uh, got my master's. And I was struggling financially and I actually took a job working at a restaurant on the weekends. 
And I'll tell you, I've never seen my parents so proud of my life. Like I have like my master's degree, I'm literally teaching. And then they're like, <laughs> my son, my son, right? Like, Cause you know, they like working in a restaurant was everything to them. And just to see that glimpse and it was kind of, I, you know, I think they, they appreciated cause they saw themselves in me, but I think they, they, I, they knew I actually had a glimpse of what they had to go through cause it's a very hard job and it's, you know, emotionally taxing and things like that. So, uh, yeah, and I'm sure, you know, there's probably similarities in, you know, some of your, the stories you have. Um, the, the, the one thing I want to ask you about uh, that's interesting is like you talked about your student teaching experience and I don't think everybody has that same <laughs> thought, right? So like what specifically about, because I have some thoughts on student teaching that I've, I've and I struggle with it, to be honest. And I think it's not, not that I don't think it's a good process, but <laughs> I don't think everyone has what you would say is a good experience. So like, what, why do you see it as such a good, good experience? Yeah, so I, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison and once you enter mm -hmm. their teaching program, it's a two year program. And the first semester of your program, you have a practicum in addition to your um, educational coursework. And then this practicum um, actually involved um, working in classrooms with students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So you actually spent that whole term getting a sense of building that empathy for a population that may be um, sidelined or disenfranchised. And then we got into our student teaching and the next term and um, our methods course as well. And I was working with a, just a fantastic biology teacher who, mm -hmm. you know, he was older, of course, but he, he was doing things that um, I'd never thought of and things that I carry with me to this day. He, mm -hmm actually had students in biology class for the final exam creating portfolios in binders. They were going through and putting together exemplars of their coursework that met the standards and then they took these portfolios home to their parents. Their parents did an evaluation of them, they did an evaluation as a student, and then the teacher did an evaluation. Now, this is really um, something I had never heard of or ever seen. Um, and that is something that's kind of stuck with me, that idea that we can think beyond this idea of a test in science, that idea that students can argue for themselves or create something. And that was really just incredible. And um, my second practicum experience was okay, but then my second student teaching experience was really great as well because in the science classroom, just seeing these teachers being able to do the science that I did not get as a high schooler mm. Um, the idea that they were not the ones who were just going to stand up and talk to the class the whole time. And they instilled in me that um, science is students doing. And school is mm. about students doing. It's not about the teacher on high handing stuff down. And I think back then that was kind of a revolutionary idea. I don't think we had gotten to that point where we are closer now, where we're really kind of seeing... Um, whether whenever that phrase, um, don't be the sage on the stage, be the guide mm -hmm. on the side, whenever that kind of came into vogue, um, that was kind of what my student experience, student teaching experience was so long ago. So this is, okay, now I want to, I want you to push back a little bit on me on mm -hmm. this, okay? Just, just if, if you feel, cause I, I've struggled with this. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, for example, you got like a really great experience. You learn a lot of things, right? Yep. And I've had people that are student teachers who want to try new stuff and they are maybe in a situation where that the teacher that they're working with doesn't, right? And, and mm -hmm. has a very different philosophy of education. And I've said this and I don't know, like, I don't know if it's a good advice, like, I'm, cause I'm want people to get a job, right? And that's part of it. And I say, look, just ask advice from your teacher, listen to what they do, because when they, and I don't know, I don't know the difference between Canada and the U S for this, but that evaluation matters a lot for you applying for your job. So like when a new teacher would apply for a job, that's like one of the first things I looked at. I didn't care about their grades mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Cause like I had, like if I base things on grades, I wouldn't have a job. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. um, like how you teach. And so I said like, cause once you get your foot in the door, then then you can start doing some of those things that you really want to kind of push the boundaries of what you can do in education. But if you can't even get in the door because you had that bad experience, you know, so I don't know, like I, I've always struggled with that because I, it's always like do best for kids, but it's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I just something, I don't know what you think when I shared that. 
no, I, no, I, feel, I, yeah. I feel a little guilty for saying that, but it's like I'm trying to help someone get into the profession. Yes, yes. No, I completely right? hear you on that. It's, it's in some cases, it's really luck of the draw. And um, teachers who are, it, it, it's one of those weird things because you have students who are looking to get an education in that classroom. These are not just random guinea pigs. These are students who are sitting there waiting to get an education. As a, as a cooperating teacher, you kind of have are serving two bosses. You kind of mm -hmm. have to make sure that these students are getting this education. But then you have this teacher who you want to be able to have some time experimentations, experimenting with the classroom. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you going to help this student teacher? If you're having a student teacher in your classroom, I think you have to be willing to say, all right, here are the outcomes. I can sit down with you and help you um, construct lessons and um, but really, you have to be willing to, and I, my, both of my cooperating teachers were able to, were saying, okay, we are just going to leave the room. We are, this is your unit, and you're going to take this unit and do with it what you will because it is yours, and this is the only time you're really going to be able to experiment before you get into that profession. And um, I'll, they'll be there to, I'll be there to support you if you need me, but really, this is yours. It's one thing, as you're getting comfortable in front of the classroom, I think it's fine for the teacher to say, okay, I want you to teach this lesson. I'll model it for you for a couple of classes, mm -hmm. but, and then you can teach. But I think eventually at some point you have to be let loose. If they're not mm -hmm. letting the, this, this teacher loose to actually design the lessons they're going to teach, um, they're doing a disservice. Right. And I appreciate it. And I, I was lucky. I'm going to, I'm getting the shout out horn. Mandy Osman was my cooperating teacher. <laughs> She was like, you only get the horn if you're legit. She was <laughs> awesome. And uh, this is something I did. And this is, you know, this might apply for if you're listening, you're, you're going into the profession, but this is going to apply to other as or factors of your, or, or, um, you know, aspects of your life. I actually, there is an award for like top intern. And, you know, if you get this, like you're golden, right? Like you're going to get a job. It's a really good thing to have in a resume. And I said to her first day, I said like, hey, one of the things I would really love is to be considered to get this award. I want you to let me know what are the things that you would need to see from me that would actually get me to that space. And uh, I was nominated, I didn't, I didn't win it, um, which, you know, is still something I'm very upset about, right? <laughs> and it's kind of ruined my life, but other than that, uh, you know, no, but like, yeah, like, and she said like, hey, these are these expectations, right? And I, like, I, I think kind of, it's, that whole notion of starting with the end in mind is really important. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little test case. Okay, so okay. I usually tell I usually this is true to some. I always talk about like how I was a horrible kid in school, which is not entirely true. I was very good for most teachers. Okay, but there is just kind of like this thing where I always was the worst human being ever in science class. Right. And, and I didn't understand why, and it wasn't the teachers, it was the subject. And the reason is that I struggled so much with the subject that for me, it was very important to be considered funny than stupid. Right. And I think that's something that we have to recognize, you know, a lot of our students sometimes is behavior thing. So I actually remember this to this day. So my teacher would turn their back on something. And do you remember, I don't know if this is even a thing anymore because I don't use paper for like really, I have, the only time I use paper is in my podcast because I got a little notepad to write down things I want to ask. And uh, do you remember like paper reinforcements? Do you remember those things? Do people use them? Like it's like the circle, like you put your paper in a binder and it was like the circular hole, right? Yes. So yes. my teacher turned around. So like my teacher turned around was writing something on the board and I took all those paper reinforcements and I put them on my face and then I said, like, I have the measles, right? <laughs> Which obviously, yeah. like, no one would think I had the measles, right? And then he, like, made me go out in front of class and say, and, like, tell everyone I was sick, right? And it was just, like, me. Do and I used to do stuff that, like, all the time. And I actually, and this is, like, a pretty vulnerable moment for me. I was so bad in this teacher's class. Like, I was such a terror. I remember he saw me when I was probably, like, 25 or 26. And he saw me. And like left, like <laughs> that's how much I, and I like, and I don't blame him. I honestly don't blame him. Like I, I remember, I remember just the shame I felt. I'm like, that was deserved. I was horrible for that man. Like every single day. Right. And it was not really in, it wasn't a reflection on him. 
like, like, like every teacher, he could have been better in some aspects of his life as I could have been better in some aspects of my life. But like when you have a student who really struggles with the content, because science, I'm like, I may, and maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's just my personal experience and my bias towards how I do in those subjects, but like science and math, I find you can have some really disruptive behaviors because of the content. Um, and then maybe, like I said, maybe it's just me. Like, what do you do when you have a student who really struggles? Like, do you, have you ever seen what I just, just not the, not the measles thing, but the, <laughs> the other stuff, like, have you ever seen that from a student? Yeah, I think, you know, for sure at the start of my career, when we were having the, the one size lesson fits all, when we kind of uh, would have that time where, okay, I'm just going to be up here and you're going to listen. And that was going to be the, the way the course was constructed. Um, and I think realizing that, I think that's one of the turning points when I realized that, oh, we are not getting true engagement. We are not meeting the learner where they're at. And I think that's a sign that um, something needs to change. And and if there's one student who's disengaged, chances are there's more than one. Mm -hmm. And um, finding that path to the student and really, I think, leveling the lessons. And when we talk about, you know, honestly, um, the last book, um, um, Innovating Inside the Box, yeah. with uh, that focus on UDL that Katie brought is really the really where we're going that first step of finding mm -hmm. that point of engagement with the learner is is truly the heart of it and if you don't know your learners and if you don't know that they're struggling and don't make that effort to see where they're at and how to build that engagement you're going to lose them right away well it's funny because you say like you have that one student who's disengaged right <laughs> i was that one student but I made sure everyone else was disengaged around me, right? Like I was just like a virus in that class. Like, you know, like those, those fake measles actually were, you know, causing more of an issue. Uh, cause I tried to disengage everybody. I remember actually, um, one of the science teachers really did something and I'll never forget it to this day. And I don't know if you know this. So he actually came out and he had a pack of matches and he came out and he said, so does anyone know why? <laughs> packs of matches are actually, you know, put into this paper, like where they're folded over and they're not exposed. And he's like, does anyone have any theories on this? And, you know, people shout out whatever he said. Well, the reason is, is that if you actually don't have the pack of matches covered, uh, the oxygen will actually go and will they'll light on fire. So they have to do this. So he like exposed the matches and he held it and we we're just sitting there. And he's like, I can't believe any of you believe me on that. And it was like the, I just, I was like hooked. Then I was in, right. And it was just like that little sense of humor. I, I'll yeah. never forget that moment and how like, it was like hilarious. Right. Cause like th that he kind of like took advantage of our, you know, like the, the experiments and we just would believe anything he said and stuff. And it was just like, like I, it was just dead silence. I remember that just waiting for those uh matches and every time like i look at a matchbook i like think of that <laughs> right like i, I think yes. of that and, and why you said that so um that that to me is is something that uh is it, it was really powerful um a lot of the work that you do uh in, in education you have connected with a ton of people outside as well so like with your access to like social media you know uh, connecting with other people like how did you start doing that and like what benefit has it had for you yeah, it's one of those weird things that actually started. I think we had an assistant principal, Jim Darren, at one time who basically said it was okay to be on Twitter. Um, you know, that idea of it's, it must have been around 2011 or whenever that was. He said it was okay. And why don't you go on there and being able to showcase, oh, here are, it's, here are resources you can find. It's not just um, posting about your day or posting memes or back then i don't even know if there were memes back then, right but, um but, but posting what we all thought people were taking pictures of their dinner and putting it on there or anything like that or just showcasing whatever but the idea that you could really find a community and like um like i said back in my um i guess it would have been um first year i was really head down introverted and not making an effort to connect with people and even though I'm still very introverted in my practice and don't do a great job of 
seeking other teachers out in my building, uh, I can find like-minded people mm -hmm. online and make that connection. And that's where we can have discourses and that's where we can connect about um, book studies or really ideas and push each other that maybe I don't have a like content area teacher. Uh, there's one other physics teacher here. He teaches um, AP level and I teach uh, regular level. So I don't have that person to really push back against. The one per only right. person I had was a co-teacher, Andy Espinosa, for the longest time. We co-taught together for like 10 years. And that was the only person I kind of had to push back against mm -hmm. and work with. And being able to find that larger community to talk to, to learn from. And when I got online, I started to realize, oh, I can learn a lot more from people who don't necessarily teach physics. Mm -hmm. I can learn from elementary school teachers. I can learn from all other content areas, things that they're doing to engage students or find new ways of presenting information or ed tech tools. That has been one of the biggest things um, because if you're not really uh, if not many people in your school are using much technology or really there's no path to really share out in a school, that social media is the one place where I'm learning new things. Well, that, that, that actually um, is interesting because I was thinking about social media when you're talking about people pushing each other, right? Mm -hmm. And there's always like, oh, it's such an echo chamber. And I've always had an issue with people saying that. Because I think when you connect in those spaces, you find people that challenge you, but that you know get have your back, right? Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes a lot of people will go to those spaces because they maybe aren't necessarily um, are, are not necessarily uh, actually allowing people to like push them to actually c connect with them in in that way. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, yep. but just kind of like going into that space and needing and and needing you know people to actually connect with you to actually kind of go through that and i think that's really kind of important is that sometimes it's the only place where i'm not actually you know getting that connection and i don't know like what you think about that if that that's one of the things because i like you know I, if someone if the only time i hear from somebody is when they're criticizing me i really like it's like i can't imagine a teacher doing that you know to a yeah. kid or especially to be honest with my kid I'd be really disappointed. They got to know you have their back. So I think that that's a really important aspect for me. Yep. I think that's really where it starts out at. You know, one of the things that um, I love about seeing you at conferences, not necessarily, your, I, I mm -hmm. love your keynotes, but I think the sessions are actually even better because you have that pushback exchange sometimes with an audience mm -hmm. member where you can have a true discussion and it's built off of that trust. I think one of the things about being online is that um, you end up finding a community that supports you but also challenges you. It's just like in any classroom, if you have a teacher who's just giving you negative, negative, negative feedback over time, um, when they give, give you positives, it doesn't necessarily feel the same. I, I think one of the great things that I do love about social media is you get your um, network together and you have people who can push back against you. And it's not just con constantly yay you, yay you. It's mm -hmm. you can build these spaces where you can actually have discussions. And I, I do think one of the great things and, you know, the more I hear you, the one of the biggest, I think probably um, every time you say the word pushback in one of your um, podcasts, we could probably take a drink because you're always looking to push back. Right. And I, I think that's one of the great things about you. People know you're authentic. People know mm -hmm. you care about education and it's not about you. It's not about ego. It's not about anything else. It's you have a deep care for education. So when you push back on something, it's not about shutting people down. That's what starts a true conversation. Mm -hmm. You can just applaud someone and say, great job, but that is really maybe an exclamation point or a period, it doesn't keep the conversation going. So when the pushback happens, that's when you really get the conversation. That's an invitation to interact. And that's what I feel that mm -hmm. as, and that's what a lot of people need. So the, the interesting thing about this is that, I, like when you say that, and I really, I really appreciate it, and I wanna push back on it. So uh, <laughs> just wanna, for all the drinkers <laughs> out there. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it to, I think sometimes I've seen people do it because it's like it's kind of like the joker like they want to see the world burn yeah. thing right mm -hmm. i'm trying to figure stuff out 
Like I, mm-hmm. I like I, I, I've been really thinking about this quite a bit. This idea, like I am, I, I don't. I've been referred to as an expert, right? And people look at books that I've written and stuff like that. And I've never felt that way. And I, I would want to be an expert learner. And Katie Novak will be, if she's listening, would be so excited about you know hearing that. Like really, like try to understand learning, but that's a whole process. But when you're and you you mentioned earlier, and we kind of lost it because we had a little uh, connection issue. Um, those spaces when when I do those keynotes, when you know I I love sharing ideas, but I'm like open to the pushback after, and it's yeah. it's kind of like it really sharpens, um, you know, kind of what I'm thinking. And I, I'll tell you so. I've done a very similar keynote, you know, many, many times. And I know you've seen it more than once. And I always try to tweak and things like that. I could go through every element of my, of a keynote that I've done, you know, a hundred times over and say, Hey, I remember talking about this and this person challenged me in Wisconsin. And so I changed it because that, that made sense on how they rephrased it. And I remember here I was in, you know, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and somebody said this to me. And that made me think different about that. And so like, it's like everything that I share, I feel has like little remnants of conversations that I've had over time that have made me better, right? And I think for me, it's not about me being better than someone, it's about me be, becoming better at what mm-hmm. I do. And that means kind of tapping into others. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you speak to that, you know, the keynotes have a great purpose of energizing and starting mm-hmm. people thinking. But you give that keynote and then, yeah, there's, mm-hmm. if there's no follow-up, and I've been at conferences where you've given a keynote and then maybe that's it, but some yep. of the other ones you have some follow-up sessions. And I, I love sitting in on those follow-up sessions because really that's where some great conversation and great mm-hmm. growth happens. And you say it's um, not just you, and it's really not just you. You're growing, but also the participants are growing, and mm-hmm. it really it's really powerful stuff and really I think I think that speaks to something we want in our classrooms too. If you are just stopping with what you do in terms of lecture and there's no conversation, um, I think that's an issue. And now as me as a teacher, uh, I'm not someone who sits up and lectures a lot and I'm not someone who's gonna, who doesn't do a great job at facilitating large group discussion. Mm-hmm. But I think the great thing I love about technology is that the ability to have those conversations digitally with my students, uh, providing feedback in digital documents, comments, and then we can start that discussion thread and pushing the students a little bit further because we can say, oh, great, you got a four out of four, excellent job, but building that space to push students a little bit further, no matter where they're at, and that's where it becomes an individual basis where uh, our feedback is our feedback just telling them what they need to do? Are we questioning or are we pushing them? And again, you as uh, in your role as a keynote speaker or a presenter pushing educators, mm-hmm. um, we can have the same role as teachers providing that pushback on our students. Well, the, the, the thing with this podcast, right? Just doing this podcast. Uh, I first started this as a way to just, share my thoughts, share my ideas, right? I wasn't actually planning on talking to anybody. Uh, because, just because, and not that I don't like having conversations, it just didn't fit into my schedule. Like I'm always traveling and, you know, to try to figure that out. And then all of a sudden I'm not traveling. I'm like, well, let's use this conversation. And I am, I, I'm not driven by getting clicks and getting likes uh, on this at all. It's not, I, I'll share it. And I'm, I'm proud to share it. And I think it's a good way to be honest with you for me to like amplify the voices of others. Right. Uh, most of the people that listen to this probably know me because they're, that's why they're probably listening to the podcast and just giving the exposure to other people's ideas is really important to me. But I, I look at this as like, you know, mini George professional learning, right? Like I could get to have these conversations, try to figure some of this stuff out. And, you know, a lot of the conversations I've had like resonate with me and I reference, you know, the podcast from one to other people. And I think that's a really important thing. And the reason I, I talk about those important conversations is that I know 
uh, right away. I think we're recording this March 25th and like I uh, spread these out over time. So I don't know if this is going to be published in time, but I know one of the things that you're, you're at least part of the organization team. I know you're not probably not the only one. Cause I think your mm-hmm. Andy is yep. also uh, organized too. And Andy, if you're listening, uh, hope, hope you're well, Andy's awesome. Um, but you're doing Ed camp Elmbrook and yeah. it's virtual, uh, this year, correct. Which means yes. it's open to everybody. Right. Uh, so like, even if you're not in Wisconsin, you, you can take part of it. So like, like tell, t- just for people who don't know basically what an ed camp is, mm-hmm. like, what is it and how does it look different maybe in a virtual space? Yeah. So in terms of this ed camp, um, if you don't know what it is, basically it is a participant driven conference or sometimes called an unconference where attendees show up and basically we go to the room and we pitch sessions so participant driven professional development rather than having a slate of here's all the breakout sessions we have a blank board um four times breakout sessions maybe eight or nine rooms and we spend the first hour or so filling that up hearing what people want if you pitch it it goes on the board so it is really professional participant driven professional development. And Mm -hmm. it is really teacher, I don't want to say teacher because I don't want to just be teachers, it's educator driven. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of the times it can be pigeonholed and it's just for teachers. And I really want people to understand that it's for administrators, for um, guidance, for basically student services, basically anyone in the educational perspective, uh, educational profession. And in terms of the virtual setting so we used to um last year we actually had our ed camp um it was on march march 7th i believe and it was a week before we actually shut down the school so Mm. a week later school was completely out for the year um went all virtual we had uh, about 275 educators from around the region so um, just basically all Wisconsin people, some Chicago people, and maybe one or two people from Minnesota. But this year that we've been able to open it up virtually, we're not going to do a full day schedule. We're only able to do a half day schedule, but we've got people because we're virtual. We have people across the nation. We have California, we have New York. We actually have, I just checked the map. Uh, now we used to, we had one person from Canada. Now we have two people from Canada. There you go. Um, that's both uh, of them. Yes, both. <laughs> That's both we have of all of them. Yes, all of you. And um, we have um, far south is Georgia and Texas. So, I mean, we're able to pull from a larger community and mm. actually build that audience. And, you know, you think about the experiences and the conversations we can have from across the nation. I, I, I'm excited mm-hmm. for it. It's not going to be the same because we're not face to face. And I think the, the virtual is going to give us some challenges in terms of getting everyone to want to share and want to talk as opposed to just sit there and have that zoom fatigue where you're just going to be on mute and just stare at the screen and maybe open a new tab. But I I, I think it's going to give us an opportunity to hear a lot of different experiences during this last year. One of the interesting things that you just said that I thought about is, um, is the, the nervousness of like, having those conversations because, you know, as we're talking pushback is kind of crucial, but, uh, I've, you know, people said to me like, Hey, we want to record your session. I'm like, just so you know that if you record it, like there's obviously, uh, things I worry about as a keynote, but you have to also understand that it limits the conversation because a lot of people won't talk because it's recorded, right. Mm -hmm. That they're a little bit nervous because, you know, whatever they say, like they might not challenge because they might be nervous of how that looks. Uh, things like that. One of the things that I think about with EdCamp and I think is, can be quite powerful, uh, is those conversations, but I've seen them kind of go awry and I don't don't, like, I'm curious of how you've dealt with this and not the sense that the conversations go bad, but someone, Hey, we're going to talk about this, but then someone puts it as the topic and then they like pop open and they just happen to have like a PowerPoint on the topic and then they just dominate the conversation for an hour. Um, I remember actually seeing that once and, uh, they really wanted to present, even though that wasn't what everyone was there for, nor was the intent of the conference. And so I just kept interrupting them with questions, uh, to like try to spark conversation. Right. And I think that to me is something important in the sense that, uh, those aren't meant to be places where, you know, someone's 
leading the conversation. It's, mm -hmm. it is, as you said, participant driven. So like when you see something like that, cause I think it's something that we need to think about, not only just ed camps, but like, uh, you know, when we're having conversation around the table, like who's dominating the conversation, you know, who's kind of taking that over. And I know just sheer size and power of like loudness of my voice. Uh, I can take over a conversation. I deliberately try to pull back cause I want other people talking and, and not sharing, but I also struggle with silence. Right. And so I'm, I'm terror. I feel very I, anxious. I'm comfortable with that. And I know this and I, I really try to work on it, but like what happens when, uh, it becomes like not participants driven, but participant yes. singular. Right. And have you, like, is that just a me experience or have you seen that before? Yep. It is definitely not just a you experience. And that's one of the pieces of feedback just because every room is going to be so different. And this mm -hmm. year, what we are building in is, um, our team, um, when I put out the call for our team, um, one of the things I said, okay, we need people who are, we need some people to be part of the planning, but what we really need a, in this um, virtual setting is at least one person from the team functioning as a facilitator in each room. Right. So in each of our breakout rooms, we're specifically going to have someone functioning as a facilitator just to make sure that um, we're going to have common expectations communicated that we really do want the conversation to be right. circular, to be a conversation. And like you said, you'll have someone pitch something. And, you know, I, I've had some great sessions in the past at ed camps when I learned about things I didn't know about. But like you said, some people are just ready to hear. I've got all this stuff to share yeah. and I'm not going to share. And even I am, uh, I'm pitching a session on portfolio, student portfolios. So hmm. of course I want to share what we are doing, but really, um, I want to be able to share and get off that stage. So mm -hmm. like you said, there's always going to be people with alternative reasons who just want to, I don't want to say yay me or get that validation or mm -hmm. get people to buy a product or buy into their system. Um, right. If you don't have that check built into the room, even as a teacher, check yourself um, or are you going to check your students? Sometimes just letting the conversation flow can be a little difficult. So the nice thing, you're doing this over Zoom, I'm assuming, correct? <laughs> yes, the nice thing is the mute button. You can, yes. mute. You can just mute. Yes. But hey, I, I do think... Yeah. Like mute, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the great things about ed camps is if you don't communicate the... So the in-person one, the vote with your feet. Mm -hmm. And I think that first year, we, we didn't do a great job of communicating it. That, yeah, it's okay. You get up and leave mm -hmm. if it's not meeting your need. So if you have one person just talking there and you built in that bravery or that, that expectation that if it's not meeting your needs, you're going to leave. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that, uh, that can be powerful having people just leave. And then hopefully you're talking to an audience of one or no one. Yeah. We were talking about that with like my workshops. I've, I've explicitly, even though it's not an egg camp and it's supposed to be me leading the session, I've said, look, if you are in the middle of this and you're saying, this is not for me, you're more than welcome to go because I want to honor your time. I don't want you to be sitting here, uh, for like 90 minutes and thinking like, what a waste of my time, right? Like I would prefer that you leave because mm -hmm. I, I like, I would kind of want to extend the same courtesy. And I'm sure there might be other sessions going on. There might be things like that. And I think that's a really important aspect of not only ed camp, like we should kind of honor that too, because mm -hmm. like that professional autonomy, uh, and it's weird because I, I swear when I say that sometimes, like some people totally take me up on it and I'm fine with that. But I think some people just me saying it makes them want to stay. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like saying like, I, I got, I trust you. you. You do what you need to do. And they're like, <laughs> I, I like this guy. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yes. cause he's, he's honoring us. And like, I, I, you know, I'd say it very sincere cause um, I don't want to, I don't want to be in a session that I feel like, Hey, I, I thought this was something and this is not, this is not what's happening for me. So, yeah. Mike, so I got to ask you this, right? Mm -hmm. um, Wisconsin. Yep, Wisconsin. Big, uh, big sports state. Yes, huge sport sports states. I mean, we've got the Packers who are really beating up on the Bears. I mean, they, you know, I, I think, hurts. you know, I started watching football. Remember that one year the Bears won the Super Bowl? I do. I, I think I started watching. Yeah, that's when I first I started quit. watching too. Yeah, I should have quit. Are you bear? You're not a. You're a Packers fan, though, right? I am a Packers fan. Yes. It, you, yeah. You knew I was a Packers fan. That's I right. knew it. I knew it's hard to live in Wisconsin. I mean, and not be a Packers fan. I. It's the one thing that gets us through the winters. Um, mm. You know, and I, of course, you know, we've had very good records. Um, right. Not have gone to the Super Bowl very recently, but 
Um, you know, we've got Aaron Rodgers. I mean, we've got the Bucks. you know. Um, <laughs> you do. And, and they're very good, too. Who, li- like, legitimately, Giannis is my uh, favorite player. Does that, yeah, yeah, and yeah. people know this about me. Like, I've gone to, like, a ton of NBA games. It's one of my, you know, mm-hmm. one of the things I loved. Uh, I actually, um, I, I don't know if I told you this. So I went, I got really good seats to a uh, box game. This is mm-hmm. the last game I went to before coronavirus. And I actually got to like see the players come out of the tunnel. Like I was right there, like high-fiving them. And the, they were, they were playing the Sixers and they were, it was supposed to be a really good game and the Bucks mm-hmm. killed them. It was just like, it was like mm-hmm. by 30. So I knew like, Hey, you, I had access to like, where they came out so that's they're going back to the locker room so i said hey like can will they like come say hi to you after or whatever and he said you have to leave like the last minute we don't let anyone go so if you go before then and you wait so yanis very near and dear to my heart because he's greek right yep. and yep. uh Giannis actually is you know uh, john is the the translation in in english and i just wanted to shake his hand and there was another greek guy there and he had a Greek national team jersey of Giannis. And Giannis came out and signed his jersey. And I was going to buy a jersey before the game. And I'm just uh-huh. like, what am I going to do? Like, get him to sign my arm? Right? And I, like, I met Giannis mm-hmm. and I said a couple of words to him in Greek. And, yeah, I'm a, like, I, I he, he is like, uh, Giannis and Luka Doncic remind me of, like, when I love basketball the most because they remind me of Magic Johnson because they are amazingly good. And they... Just Yanis has like the funniest personality. He's just like, uh, I saw him like, you know, people like yell him in his car and he like does little TikTok dances and things like that. I love that guy. Yeah, we are really lucky to have him. I mean, you just are. a great personality and mm-hmm. incredible player, incredible person. And, you know, seeing everything that went on this year with Black Lives Matter and to have mm-hmm. the Bucks take over with that and the voting push in terms of our city is just amazing so um really lucky to have these um people are willing to stand up for other people and not just Mm -hmm. sit on it sit in their um in their profession and actually be activists yeah and he he is he is a a very interesting person uh i actually have um his his first uh generation of basketball shoes and like just his family just like his Mm -hmm. You know that that's something that really appeals to me and uh, there's something about like i'm my father's son or something it's like written on the shoe uh and, and just yeah he's an interesting so like when you look at all of this and you have a wisconsin teams like who who is like your team is it the box is it the packers who is it it's you know it's probably the packers because i got into football a lot earlier yeah. than basketball i mean the bucks um were not as good as I, you know, the Bucks right. more recently have been a lot better, but yeah, they didn't Jack Sigma and then Giannis. <laughs> yes, Basically, that's yes. it. Yes, that was it. Kind of, kind of, they're kind of like the Bears of the NBA. They really are. They really <laughs> are. But I mean, you know, I mean, we had going back from Jack Sigma. Of course, we had Lou Alcindor right. first, and then you know, that's my guy, Kareem. Yes. That's Kareem. my guy. Yeah. You also had uh, what Ray Allen and mm-hmm. Ray Allen and Glenn and- Robinson. Glenn, Glenn, I always, it's Glenn Robinson. Yeah. Yeah. The, I remember yeah. when they played together and they were like, Ray Allen was there for quite a while, wasn't he? Yes. Ray Allen was there for quite a while. Really great. Great, great teams. But, yeah. yeah. It's, I it's mean, like, great, great players, maybe not the best teams, but um, yeah. Yeah. But, the, but they, they um, like, I've, I've never been to a Packers game. I'd like to go. Uh-huh. I've been to a box game and they do a really great job of like, cause it's a, um, you know, like they're a really good team, but it's like a, it's just feels really community minded, even in yes. the arena. Right. Which is not always the feel when you go to NBA games. Right. Like no, it's, yeah. it's just kind of neat to see. So yeah, people are really happy to be, I, I think a Packers game would be great for you to go to sometime, you know, see Aaron Rodgers in person. I mean, fantastic. Soon as they, soon as they let me over the border, man, <laughs> doing we'll everything we'll as soon see. as they let me over the border. All right. Yeah, we're we're like we're like on super lockdown in Canada right now, so I don't know how long this is gonna last. But like, right. man, it's it's awesome to talk to you and just sit down and chat. And uh, like, I really appreciate you not only everything you do for your kids, but just you know the community of education as a whole and watching you connect with other people. It's it's just it's just amazing to to see that and just kind of watch you, you know, 
connect and grow over the years and uh and i appreciate just how much you've advocated for me over the years too so and really appreciate your kind words so thanks for being on the podcast uh anyone who's listening uh you're gonna see mike's uh social media in the description down below so make sure you give him a follow and give him a shout out and if you're a bears fan make sure you give him an extra shout out because <laughs> next year with uh what andy dalton who hasn't been good in like 10 years <laughs> that now now the bears are gonna win so Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Mike, thanks for being on. I hope you all have a wonderful day.